I'm a physiotherapist at the Surgical Optimization Clinic. Hi, my name is Laura and I'm also a physiotherapist at the Surgical Optimization Clinic. Today we're going to be guiding you through your Class 2 education in preparation for your total joint surgery. Please write down any questions that you have along the way so that you can discuss with one of our team members after this presentation. Today we will talk about the requirements prior to your surgery, what to do to prepare for surgery, what your hospital stay will look like, and what to do once you get home, what your physio follow-up will look like, and other things to consider like driving and flying and things to watch for once you get home. Prior to your surgery, you will have a nursing phone screen, a physio consult for an equipment referral form, the class presentation, diagnostic tests, and an anesthesia consult. surgery, you'll be required to stop all of your vitamins, herbals, and minerals one week before surgery. This includes things like vitamin D and glucosamine chondroitin. You should only take the medications directed to you by your anesthesiologist. When you speak to the anesthesiologist on the phone, they will direct you as to which medication you will need to stop and the time frame that you will be required to stop it in. Most of the medications that you take will be provided to you while you're staying with, in, with us in the hospital. You will be required to bring in any specialty medications such as a puffer that you may use for your asthma or special eye drops that you may use for your glaucoma. You'll be required to start fasting at midnight the night before your surgery. That means if you have surgery on a Wednesday morning, you're going to have nothing to eat or drink by mouth after midnight on Tuesday night. You can still brush your teeth the morning of your surgical procedure, and if you've been advised by your anesthesiologist to take a medication even the morning of surgery, you can still take that medication with a small sip of water. The night before your surgery, we're gonna ask that you have a shower with liquid soap and wash your hair. We ask for liquid soap rather than bar soap, as bar soap tends to leave a bit of a residue on the skin. The morning of your surgery, we're going to ask that you have a second shower, again washing your body with liquid soap and then putting on a pair of clean clothes to come to the hospital. We'll ask that you don't wear any deodorant, perfume, powder, and to remove any fingernail polish prior to coming in for surgery. We ask that you avoid putting on any skin creams or lotion over top of that operative area for three days prior to your surgery and that you do not shave your operative leg for seven days prior to surgery. If you do have any open sores, wounds, or a rash, we ask that you please call the Surgical Optimization Clinic and speak to one of the nursing staff so that we can address any concerns that you may have prior to proceeding with your surgery. talk about your equipment requirements and any precautions you may have to follow. You will receive an equipment form from your physiotherapist for your local Red Cross. It is important that you pick up all required equipment one week prior to your surgery date so that you are ready and prepared for surgery. Please note that the Red Cross is volunteer run and their hours may vary. Please contact your local Red Cross for their current hours. When sizing your equipment from the Red Cross, use your wrist crease to measure the appropriate height. With your elbow slightly bent at your side, the hand grip height for the crutch, cane, and walker should be at the level of your wrist crease. With the crutches, we recommend two to three finger width space between your underarm and the axilla pad as shown in the photo. If you are waiting a total hip replacement, you may require some additional equipment depending on your hip precautions. Different surgeons and approaches require different precautions. Please refer to your handout for your specific surgeon's precautions and restrictions. These precautions are in place to reduce the risk of dislocation, assist in bone growth, and allow time for soft tissue healing that is damaged during the surgery. These restrictions can be in place for up to 12 weeks. Some of the extra equipment that may be required if you're getting a hip replacement can include a high density foam cushion. This is to help raise the heights of your chairs. It can be moved from the kitchen to the living room to your car to help you follow and respect those precautions. 
You also may need a long-handled reacher, a shoehorn, and a sockade to help you with getting dressed. Let's talk about your hospital arrival. The booking office will call you the day before your surgery. You will be told your operation time and what time to arrive at the surgical services reception desk for registration. When you are at the hospital, we ask that you leave all your jewelry at home. There is no exceptions. They cannot have any jewelry in the OR. The nurse will check you in and all your belongings will be returned to your family members or your support person. An anesthetist will come and speak to you, as will the surgeon. They will confirm the procedure and then the nurse will take you to the OR. The only thing that goes with you to the OR will be your dentures, glasses and hearing aids. The surgical procedure takes between 40 to 60 minutes for a standard hip and knee replacement. If you're having the anterior approach for the hip replacement, it may take up to 90 minutes. After the OR, you will be transferred to the recovery room. You'll notice you have a bandage, an IV running. Sometimes there is use of a urinary catheter or a wound drain. Your average stay in recovery is around two hours. After surgery, your lung spaces shrink, which puts you at an increased risk of lung complications like pneumonia. Post-surgery, you're also at a higher risk of developing blood clots for the first six weeks. As a result, we would like you to start some basic exercises for your breathing and circulation while in recovery. The exercises we'd like you to start with would be to take five deep breaths every hour that you're awake, followed by a cough. For the circulation exercises, we ask that you pump your feet up and down, move your ankles in circles, and wiggle your toes. Squeeze your bum, slide each leg up and down the bed, and lift your arms overhead. Your muscles act as a pump and keep that blood circulating. This will help prevent those blood clots. Once you get up to the ward, you will have lab work, an x-ray, possibly a dressing change. You will be up in a chair for your meals and up to the bathroom. You will be able to stand on your new joint right away, weight bearing as tolerated. The nurses and physio will help you with this. Ice and elevation is going to be very important to help manage your pain and swelling and your discharge day will depend on your status, how you're doing and the surgical approach. When we talk about ice and elevation, there are a few key points to ensure that you are elevating properly. First off, it is important that your leg is elevated higher than your heart. This means laying your upper body down and leg elevated on multiple pillows, as shown in the photo. Elevation requires approximately 30 minutes in this position to allow time for any drainage to return back to the heart and be reabsorbed by the body. This is also a great time to ice and complete your ankle pumps for circulation. If you are having a knee replacement, there is one extra component you need to watch for. Due to scar tissue buildup, it is very important you are always resting with your knee straight. If this is not done, you may never get your knee fully straight after surgery. It is a battle physio cannot win. Notice in the photo how straight the knee is. On that note, when you are not elevating your leg above your heart, but maybe resting on the couch or in bed, again, it is essential that your knee remains straight. You can support your lower leg with a pillow for comfort, but it is important that the pillow be positioned lengthwise to enforce that straight knee. Do not place the pillow crosswise. If you are having a hip replacement, you may find two or three pillows between your legs for support while lying on your side is most comfortable. If your specific hip precautions require you to avoid crossing your midline, you may require a pillow between your knees while lying on your back to ensure proper alignment. When it comes to incision care, there are two different systems depending on your surgeon's preference. These two systems include staple closure or glue closure. If your surgeon closes your incision with staples, you will be required to buy your dressing supplies prior to your surgery. We recommend purchasing the MePor dressing, which can be purchased at any pharmacy. If your pharmacy does not carry the MePor brand, you can ask your pharmacist to assist you in finding a strip type dressing that can be applied 
post total knee or total hip replacement. We're going to ask that you apply a new dressing anytime it is moist, soiled, no longer secure, or after you've had a shower. You can shower post-op day two, so long as the incision is dry and not draining. In the shower, you're going to let water and soap wash over top of the incision. Once you get out of the shower, you're going to pat dry with a clean towel and then let the skin air dry out before replacing it with a new strip dressing. Your staples will be removed by either your surgeon, your family doctor, or your physiotherapist within the next 10 to 14 days, and this appointment will be organized for you prior to your discharge from hospital. If your surgeon chooses to close your insertion with glue, you can shower post-op day one. Again, you're going to have a shower, let the soap and water wash over the incision. You don't need to rub or scrub over top of the area. Once you come out of the shower, you're going to pat dry with a clean towel. This glue is applied directly in the operating room and is a watertight dressing, which means that if nothing gets out, nothing gets in, so no further dressing supplies will be required. Your healthcare team will guide you as to when and how your glue will be removed. Your discharge will happen before 10 a.m. if you are staying with us a second night. Please ensure that the person coming to pick you up has your two-wheeled walker in the car with them for your trip home. There is a resource link provided at the end of this presentation for tips regarding car transfer techniques, ascending and descending the stairs, as well as tub and shower transfers. Any medication prescriptions that you are required, they will be provided to you prior to your discharge from hospital. about what to do once you get home. We ask that you keep moving. It is very important to move every few hours. Continue with home exercises from the physiotherapist at the hospital. We want you to complete those exercises three or four times a day, taking pain medication before. It is important that short but frequent bouts of activity, balancing the activity and the rest. Using ice is required and elevating the leg frequently to manage the swelling. If you are from Kelowna, Lake Country, West Kelowna, or Peachland, you will be attending outpatient physiotherapy in the Kelowna area. Five to seven days after discharge from hospital, you will attend an outpatient physiotherapy appointment. Hips will be followed up as needed at the physiotherapist's discretion, but knees will need to come in more frequently. This can be up to two times per week, so please ensure that rides are arranged as you will not be allowed to drive at this time. If you are from out of town, your physio follow-up will be completed at your local centre and their timelines may vary. Your plan will be reviewed with you during your physiotherapy consult at the Surgical Optimization Clinic preoperatively. If you have any questions about your physiotherapy plan, please seek the Surgical Optimization Clinic to review. IV base narcotic. This will help to control your pain during this initial phase of your recovery. Once up on the ward, you will transition to an oral based pain medication, and upon discharge, you will be given a 7 to 10 day prescription for a home narcotic. Due to timelines of healing, you may require over the counter Tylenol as well to supplement your pain management plan. What are some of the signs and symptoms to look for if you think you have an infection? The most common signs are redness, swelling, drainage, and heat. Sometimes you may experience a slight fever or general feeling of unwellness. If you have any concerns regarding an infection, please contact your surgeon's office. If you are unable to speak to your surgeon, please seek advice from a walk-in clinic, family doctor, or emergency department as needed. As mentioned previously, you are at risk of developing blood clots for the first six weeks after surgery. While the exercise will assist in preventing the blood clot, you may also be placed on a blood thinner to further prevent complications. 
If you were to get a blood clot, what would that look like? A clot usually starts in your lower leg in your calf muscle. This is known as a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis. You may notice your calf is red, swollen, or tender to touch. If you feel you have a clot or are developing a clot in your calf, please seek assistance from your family doctor for further investigation. If that clot was to break off and travel through the bloodstream into your lungs, that is referred to as a pulmonary embolus or a PE. If you were to develop a PE, you would experience shortness of breath, possibly chest pain or pressure in the chest. This is a medical emergency and a 911 call is required. The number one post-op complication after surgery is constipation. It is recommended that you try to have a bowel movement the day before or even the day of your surgery if possible. To prevent constipation post-operatively, we recommend walking to tolerance, continuing your home exercises, drinking lots of water, and eating lots of leafy greens. You should have a bowel movement within the first three to five days post-operatively. If constipation remains an issue, you may need to use a stool softener or laxative as necessary, or consult your healthcare team for further recommendations. In regards to dental care, all cleanings or fillings should be done within two weeks prior to surgery. Any extensive work, crowns, root canals, dental extractions, or major restoration surgery requires six weeks prior to surgery. We ask that you wait three months post-operatively prior to returning to the dentist in less urgent. Most of you will be wondering when you can drive after surgery. That can depend on the side of surgery, the strength response time, the type of vehicle, whether it's a standard or automatic, and what medications you are taking at the time. Plan to require rides for the first six weeks after surgery, although some of you may still feel uncomfortable to drive at that time and may delay. It's usually around that four to six week post-surgery mark before you feel comfortable driving. Ensure that you are comfortable and confident. Also ensure that you are following any specific guidelines outlined by your surgeon if they were provided. When we talk about air travel, we'd like you to think seriously before flying. The first six weeks after surgery, you do have that increased risk of developing a blood clot. If you need to fly a short haul, consider the seat height if you're a hip replacement and keep moving your ankles and feet. Walk the aisles as you can to promote the blood flow and if you can, wear compression stockings. You must consider any specific guidelines from your surgeon as well. It's also important to allow extra time through security as your new joint will likely set off those metal detectors. Another thing to consider when you're flying is your insurance coverage, as even province to province can differ significantly. So what can you expect after total joint replacement surgery? You will have good mobility and decreased pain, providing you continue to exercise beyond your sessions with physiotherapy. The surgeon does their part, they install that new hinge. Physio does their part in coaching you and giving you guidance for optimal results, but it is up to you to do the work. Changes occur over the first 12 months and will require lifelong commitment. Please discuss any questions or concerns you have regarding specific activities you would like to return to with your physio or your surgeon, as we are here to help you achieve that improved quality of life. This concludes our class two education session. Please discuss any questions with our surgical optimization team during your consultations with the nurse, physiotherapist, or call our office at 250 9801515. The resources mentioned previously are listed on the next slide. Please review prior to your surgery. We wish you all the best moving forward. To complete stairs safely after hip or knee replacement surgery, it is recommended you have at least one railing. If you don't have one, it is suggested you get one installed prior to surgery as it is the safest way to complete stairs postoperatively. No matter what side the rail is on, you always go to that side. Normally, we tell you to hold your cane or crutch in the opposite side to your surgical side. However, with the stairs, it is important you utilize the railing. For example, if your railing is on the right-hand side, you would hold the rail on the right and use your cane or crutch on the left. When going up the stairs, you want to lead with your good leg first 
followed by your cane or crutch and the surgical side, taking one step at a time. The cane or crutch and the surgical side always stick together. When descending the stairs, lead with your cane or crutch and the surgical side, followed by your good side. Again, taking one step at a time.